today we will have a lecture about the disturbance of the adrenal gland. The adrenal gland is located, as you know, on the top of both kidney side. This gland is composed into two parts. One is the medulla inside, that is a part of the sympathetic nerve system, and the cortical area that's surrounding the medulla. This adrenal gland synthesize three, or let's see, two different major categories. One is the catecholamine that is connected to the sympathetic nervous system and the cortical area synthesizes at least three different types of hormones, such as the glucocorticoid, mineral corticoid, and the androgens. If you are looking at the histological structure of this cortical area, from the outer to the inner part, this is a capsule, this is the outer part, we do have the zona glomerulosa. The zona glomerulosa mainly synthesizing the mineral corticoids, the fasciculata, the relatively this is the biggest part that's going to synthesize the glucocorticoids, and the reticularis area, the right connected to the adjacent to the medulla that synthesizes the androgens. In them, they do have different enzyme system, and this is why they do have different hormone released. Now, in the medulla, we do have the major epinephrine, and the smaller part is the norepinephrine that is synthesized. Now, uh, you learn in biochemistry the synthesis of the steroid hormones. That's a very complicated one. Every hormone is originated from the cholesterol ring. This is why we do need cholesterol, not only for the membrane composition, but we do need some for the steroid hormone synthesis as well. And the first step that is not listed here, that is called the side cleavage enzyme that is making the pregnenolone. I highlighted some important hormones that you should remember somehow such as, for example, the 17 hydroxylase that is going to put a hydroxy group in the 17 position. So this is needed to have a normal synthesis of the glucocorticoids and the androgens. Another hormone that is usually located and that I highlighted in the vertical manner, they are necessary again the synthesis of the glucocorticoids and mineral corticoids, such as the first one, the 3 beta hydroxy uh, hydrogenase, or the 21 hydroxylase, or the 11 beta hydroxylase. There are much more enzymes, but these trees are very important, especially when we are talking about the adrenogenital syndrome or adrenocortical hyperplasia. So, if you remember some, if we are, that's the proximal part, the 11 beta hydroxylase. If this enzyme is missing, we do have only the precursors. Very similarly, when we do have the 21 hydroxylase deficiency, we do not have the end products, but we do have an accumulation of the precursors. Now let's see the regulation of the adrenal cortex. Basically, the adrenal cortex mainly regulated by the ACTH, cortisol, or glucocorticoid axis. So the cortisol is the material that is going to feed back the pituitary ACTH release. The mineral corticoid regulated differently. However, the mineral corticoid can be influenced by ACTH as well because the first step is a side cleavage enzyme, as I mentioned, that's important, regulated by ACTH as well. So this is why if you do have more pregnenolone, you could have more mineral corticoid as well. However, the major regulatory step is a renin angiotensin aldosterone system. This is how we regulate the mineral corticoids. Now let's see how this feedback or how this regulation works. First of all, the cortisol can feed back the pituitary, can feed back the hypothalamus, 
so can alter the CRH release as well. Plus, another thing that is important in the regulation of the adrenal cortex is the inflammatory cytokines or inflammatory cells. So to, for example, if you do have inflammation, if you do have any kind of stress stimuli, you can have directly from the central nervous system as stimulus or from the mononuclear cells, so the phagocytic system, you do have certain cytokines that can alter the hypothalamus or can alter the pituitary itself in using, for example, leukemia inhibitor factors. And not only the inflammatory process is going on, but the adipocytes, especially the visceral adipocytes that releasing the leptin, and the leptin will inhibit the release of the CRH, and this is how the cortisol release is altered by the leptin. Not only these hormones is a regulatory in the case of the glucocorticoid, the mineral corticoid effect, but we do have some enzymes in the target tissues that is going to convert the steroid hormones or the precursors of the steroid hormones to the active hormones, or the opposite can happen. For example, in type one, that is going to produce cortisol. So in those area, when the cortisol effecting in adipocytes, for example, or, or liver, this is the major component of type one. However, in the kidney, this is this cortisol is inhibited. Somehow is step done. There's a cortisone release is happening or a conversion occurs. So this is hard. It can be specific effect. Now let's start with the cortisol first. So let's start with the glucocorticoids. As you know very well, the effect of the cortisol is very diverse. It's almost 50 intracellular mechanisms are altered with the cortisol. And when you apply, and, and the most widely used drug is the cortisol. But when you apply this cortisol, when you use the cortisol, you will interfere with a lot of the physiological uh, mechanisms. Now let's start. You can assume that the cortisol, that's a stress hormone. So it's going to mobilize energy. How can we mobilize energy? We can mobilize energy from the glycogen. So the glyconeolysis is increases, but not only the glycolysis, but the gluconeogenesis is turned on, so the proteolysis will happen in the muscle cells. This is why if you starve or if you do have an excess of the glucocorticoid, usually those patients will have slim extremities, meaning that they do have less muscle structure. Another thing about the glucocorticoid is that usually a lot of glucose. A lot of glucose is going to deposit as a form of adipocyte. This is why the central obesity be a very common feature of the excess of the cortisol. Another thing that can happen, and usually <clears throat> you're not thinking about it, but because it's, I think it's right here, when they do have an increased glucocorticoid that does have a permissive effect of the catecholamine receptor, the sensitizing the catecholamine receptors. So hypertension can develop. So vascular contraction, peripheral resistance increase can occur. Now, part of this vasoconstriction plus the increase of the acid secretion can cause gastric ulceration. But not only the gastric ulceration can happen in this patient, but insulin resistance can develop because we do have an elevated glucose level in the blood. Plus, that's will stimulate the, relatively the insulin secretion because you have to have a higher insulin release to normalize the glucose. And by the end, the beta cells can be depleted very easily. Another thing that can happen, as you know, the stria. What does 3A? Why did 3A develop? First of all, because we do have an expansion of the adipocytes. So, and that's stretching the skin. However, not only the stretching, 
but the collagen synthesis is altered, it's inhibited. This is why we do have osteoporosis because the bone formation will decrease plus the glucocorticoid incre increases the calcium resorption from the bone and the excretion to the kidney. In the kidney, we do have an effect on the GFR. If we do have relatively more, we do have more GFR. If you do remember when we discussed the diabetes insipidus, and in some times in those patients who has glucocorticoid deficiency, this diabetes insipidus is manifested when they started to treat with glucocorticoid, because glucocorticoid increases the GFR, more filtration. So this is why the urine volume will increase. Another effect that they are using the inhibited immune system, the inhibit, for example, the uh, neutrophil count. So in acute inflammatory reaction, we do have less immune response. So lymphocytopenia can develop, eosinopenia can develop. However, you have to be very careful because the immune system is altered, but what happening, the bacteria can overgrow. Another effect of the glucocorticoid that can be, for example, increased uh, neural excitability. So emotional disturbance or other agitation can happen in the patient. So central nervous side effect can be as well. Now, what will happen when we do not have normal adrenocortical effect? So when we do have an insufficiency of the function of the adrenal cortex, there are two types. It can develop in acute situation or can develop in chronic situation. Let's start with the acute situation. This acute situation that we could call as a crisis, adrenal cortical crisis, the characteristic features, mostly hypotension and shock, circulatory shock, fever, dehydration, nausea, vomiting, anorexia, weakness, apathy, depression, depressed mentation, and hypoglycemia. So the leading symptoms usually is a circulatory shock. Now there's a very famous let's say, disease that is called the waterhouse friedrichsen syndrome. When we do have an Aceria's infection, the meningococci infection, and the toxins of the meningococci will cause a bleeding necrosis of the adrenal cortex, as you see here, hemorrhagic necrosis, destruction, and the patient will have relatively hypotension, suffusion all over the body, uh, plus high temperature, very high fever. So that's a very high life-threatening situation that can happen with Waterhouse Friedrichs and syndrome. Now, a most common one, that's a chronic adrenocortical insufficiency, what is develops slowly, takes decades to develop. Now, let's look at a first case. We do have a 12-year-old girl presented with a vagus abdominal discomfort for six months. So we do have an abdominal pain, let's see. She had not this occasional diarrhea, but hadn't passed any blood. She admitted to the weight loss, six kilograms of weight loss, and anorexia. On examination, she was obviously pigmented, although she thought this was, uh, this was sun-induced. However, her buccal mucosa and gums were also brown. That's very important for me because if you attend your uh, buccal mucosa or the gums inside your mouth is not brown for sure. There were no other physical signs. They measure the lab, the sodium, potassium. And as you see here, we do have hyponatremia and hyperkalemia. And the serum cortisol was low and ACT stimulation was impaired. So her serum also contained antibodies to the pancreatic islet cells and thyroid microsomes. So what could be the diagnosis? So this is a typical of this called Edison disease or chronic glucocorticoid insufficiency. So 
In view of her young age at presentation and the serum antibodies, she will be followed at yearly intervals to see if they develop an other autoimmune endocrinopathies, such as, for example, the Hashimoto thyroiditis or diabetes type mellitus. So that's be very commonly associated. If somebody does have one type of uh, autoimmune diseases, mostly that's can be associated with some other autoimmune diseases. Now, if you do have time, you can watch this Dr. Ha's videos. I'm not going to show this one right now. I do have some other videos, but uh, uh, this is very nicely, you can show how and what kind of clinical symptoms will develop in a patient who has this adrenal cortical deficiency. Now let's see the uh, clinical presentation. This is summarized. That's the brown skin. And why do we have the brown skin? Because we do not have the glucocorticoid, the cortisol release from the adrenal uh, cortex. There is missing the feedback mechanism, a lot of ACTH. As you know, the ACTH is a part of the pro melanocortin, and this kind of precursor has the MSH. However, don't forget it. ACTH itself has an MSH sequence in it. So you don't need to have the procursal if you do have only the ACTH, very high level, that can color the skin, can have an MSH action. Now, another thing changes in the distribution of the body hair, some nice mustache, hypoglycemia, and Postural hypotension, so the orthostatic hypotension can develop. Weight loss, as we showed in the previous case studies, GI disturbance, diarrhea, abdominal pain, and weakness. Now, the adrenal crisis you can develop uh, very rare, that usually associated with uh, dehydration, vascular collapse, renal shutdown, and very characteristic, the ratio of the sodium and the potassium changes. Sodium will decrease while the potassium is going to increase. And I mentioned you that not only the skin, but the buccal area can be colorated and you do see here. So for example, if you look at the black people, they still can have a darker gum, for example, on the mucosa. Now, uh, what could cause the primary adrocortical insufficiency or this called Edison's disease? This is a famous, let's see, patient, the John Fitzgerald Kennedy, who possibly had Edison disease. And after when we was treated, you can see that they changed the shape immediately. Now, the most common cause, as you do see here, the monomanic, that's the A as autoimmune diseases. It takes about 80-90% of the all cases can be degenerative amyloidosis, very rare, or drugs, for example, uh, ketoconazole can cause this. Infection is important, mostly the tuberculosis, but today is the HIV infection. And secondary, when the ACTH develops, however, when you do have less ACTH, such as a hypopituitarism, there is no bronze if pigmentation develops and adrenal bleeding can happen or neoplasia and metastasis. So if you're looking at only the highlighted, such as autoimmune infection or neoplasia, these are, let's see, taking out the most of the cause of this Edison disease. Now, the secondary adrenal cortical insufficiency, secondary, so not the primary, Edison is the primary one, the secondary, usually when we do have mostly exogenous glucocorticoid therapy, very widely used. However, you have to be very careful with the administration or the cease or the stop to give this drug because when you give the drug to the patient and if you stop suddenly, that could cause a adrenocortical insufficiency acutely. Because the exogenous glucocorticoid suppresses the ACTH release, suppresses the pituitary, and the pituitary needs time to come back the normal ACTH release. Now, how do you administer the glucocorticoid? Usually, if you can record your physiologic studies, the glucocorticoid level is the highest one in the morning. 
and the lowest one in the night. So this is why what they do, they give the glucocorticoid in the morning. So this is how by the end, by the night, usually the glucocorticoid level can decrease. So still maintain some kind of regulatory systems. Now, uh, when you stop what they needed, usually when they are introduced the treatment, you are upgrading, let's say, you are increases the dose. When you stop it, you should decrease the dose so it's not immediately should be stopped, but you have to leave some time for it. Now, the clinical feature of the secondary adrenocortical uh, insufficiency usually is a chronic one, as we mentioned before, no pigmentation, no volume depletion, because the glucocorticoid is the major regulatory step in the adrenal cortical function, while, uh, in the glucocorticoids only, while the mineral corticoid mainly renin angiotensin system and hypotension, usually they develop uh, orthostatic hypotension. Laboratory findings can be anemia. Anemia could be caused by a lot of things. In the next semester, we do have a dedicated lecture about anemia. Lymphocytosis can happen, eosinophilia can happen, and the basal ACTH is low or normal, and the ACTH in, let's see, the CRH uh, test, for example, causes a less response to the ACTH and the stimulatory test, such as the metirapone test, that's be abnormal. And this is what we discussed during the seminars, the practical seminars. Now, what we should, let's see, investigate when we want to diagnose this kind of adrenocortical insufficiency, measuring, let's see, the blood pressure to showing that this orthostatic hypotension occurs. Let's measure in the blood test, the serum, sodium, potassium, the serum, sodium usually low, while potassium is high, as I mentioned before, and the glucose level is uh, low one. Let's measure the random serum glu uh, cortisol level. The best one to measure the serum cortisol, the serum cortisol, but the saliva cortisol, this is what we are going to discuss later as plus in the uh, practice we did. And ACT general test or plasma renin level should be measurement or uh, measuring some other, let's see, component to see whether we do have a hypopituitarism completely, the gonadal function, the HIV test, an antibody test, an aldosterone test. An imaging technique should be used as well. So to see, for example, about ultrasound, CT, MRI, we can use or X-ray, we can use it. Now, as I mentioned, the Anisonian crisis, when they developed a very sudden, let's say somebody has a chronic, diseases and that's chronic disease is exacerbated. So this is can cause a severe shock, hypotension, tachycardia, very similarly to the Fredrickson syndrome, Waterhouse Fredrickson syndrome. However, this based on this chronic Arizonian diseases. So fever, abdominal pain, nausea, hyponatremia, hyperkalemia, and the hyperkalemia can cause arrhythmia and that can further aggregate the circulatory problem. And what the management, this is what you will learn in uh, internal medicine, airways, breathing, circulation, disability, and exposure. This is the A, B, C, D, E assessment. And correct the volume. This is the first one all the time. When we do have a diabetes, ketoacidosis, or diabetes, or osmotic uh, coma, for example, the first one, the volume, you should replace it or replace the glucocorticoid, correct the metabolic abnormalities, and treat the underlying cause. This should be the treatment. Now, let's go on and let's see another case studies. We do have this 27 year old woman present with depression, insomnia, increased facial fullness. So it's a round face and recent increase in facial hair. She had also had an episode of depression and acute psychosis following uncomplicated delivery of the normal baby boy nine months previously. Her menses have been irregular since their resumption after the birth. She is not breastfeeding. Physical exam. The heart rate was 90 beats per minute and the blood pressure was 146 over 110, so hypertensive. Her face was puffy with an increase in the facial hair and rubbing complexion. 
there was no truncal obesity, peripheral wasting, or striae. The lab values, what they found, serum electrolyte, white cell count, hemoglobin, and hematocrit were all within the normal limits. So what can be, let's see, the cause. Now, these are the lab values for the endocrine lab values. As you do see, almost everything is normal. The tidal function, the productive level, the LH, FSH levels, only we do see the difference in the cortisol level. The first one, <clears throat> as you do see right here, there is no difference between the night and the morning cortisol level. This is what they're measuring in the saliva, the best one. Or you can measure in the collected urine as well, but everything is was high. Plus, as you do see here, in the morning, the ACTH level was very, very high. They measured the metabolite of the glucocorticoids, such as the 17 hydroxycorticosterone that was increased, and the mineral corticoid metabolite or the androgen metabolite, the zecatosteroids are also increased in this patient. So uh, dexamethasone was given every six hours for a, a 48 hours with a 24-hour urine collection, and they measured in that time the 17 hydroxycorticosteroids prior to a test to the baseline and on the second day is a test. And what they found, as you see here, the low dose, it was high, so it's uh, relatively, that is meaning that this patient has a Cushing syndrome. This is what you discussed already in the practice. And the high dose caused suppression. So, the diagnosis. So this is the summary of the access of the glucocorticoids, such as emotional disturbance, memory deficiency, osteoporosis, very similarly what we discussed with the glucocorticoid effect, buffalo ham, moon phase, cardiac hypertrophy, hypertension. Now hypertension is important for in because if somebody has a primary hypertension and you have to treat the patient with cortisol, you have to watch very carefully the, uh, uh, the pressure, the blood pressure. Gastric ulcer can develop central obesity, striase, amenorrhea, or menstrual disturbances, weakness, muscle weakness, purpura, skin necrosis. So all things can develop with this patient. Now, very important to see what the Cushing syndrome is. Cushing syndrome is not a typical or specific disease. If I want to summarize or want to def define the Cushing syndrome, there's only the sum of the clinical sign of a chronic glucocorticoid excess. So nothing as the sum of those effects that could be induced by a chronically in increased glucocorticoid level. Now, in pathophysiology cases, we can distribute it to the cause two major categories, ACTH-dependent and ACTH-independent form. The most common one, ACTH-dependent, means that when we do have an increased ACTH level, the very commonly the pituitary adenoma that this girl had causes an increased ACTH synthesis, while another one is ectopic ACT syndrome, as, as you see here, about the 15%, that still increases, but the origin is a different one. It's not for the pituitary, but it's coming from the lung, small cell carcinoma. ACT independent form when we do have less ACTH because we do have a primary problem. That, for example, uh, adenoma or carcinoma of the adrenal cortex synthesized uh, glucocorticoids, but iatrogenically you can cause an ACTH independent Cushing syndrome as well. For example, in some leukemias or some other autoimmune disorders, when the patient is treated with uh, cortisol, they can develop Cushing syndrome. Now, uh, as I said in the previous slide, the most commonly the pituitary adenoma, micro or macro adenoma can cause, or hyperplasia can occur. Uh, adrocortical hyperplasia bilateral can occur in simple adrocortical hyperplasia or ectopic ACT syndrome, bilateral neural hyperplasia and adrenal tumors, for example, that these kind of categories you will learn in pathology. Now, Let's talk about a little bit about the Cushing's disease. That's a 
tip a specific disease when we do have a tumor that drives from the pituitary. But the first one that the random excretion uh, or acetate secretion occurs. So the absence of the normal diurnal rhythm, you do have the same high in the morning and in the night. So there is no difference between these two. Uh, there is no physiological feedback mechanism. So when you increase the cortisol, that won't feedback the acetate. Looks like normally we do have a set point that is put uh, uh, be a higher value. This is why you need much more ACTH to suppress, let's see, uh, more glucocorticoids to suppress a little bit the ACTH. Now, there is no hyperpigmentation because we never reach that high value of the ACTH or MSH. And because we do have a tumor, the tumor itself, it can suppress the other trope hormones, such as the TSH, the growth hormone, LH, FSH and androgen excess can develop and that can cause in women hirsutism, acne, amenorrhea, while in men decreased libido and impotence can happen. Now, uh, these are, that's a normal regulatory system. This is only explaining what will happen. So if you do have a pituitary tumor, a lot of ACTH, a lot of cortisol, that is going to inhibit back the feedbacking, the short and long, and long feedback. So the hypothalamus and pituitary, and this is why the CRH level relatively is low and the CRH stimulation won't increase further the ACTH release. Now, what about the ectopic ACTH syndrome? That's another type of the ACTH dependent form that again, the ACTH release is randomly and episodically happening, but very highly elevated ACTH level we do have as high as the kid cause hyperpigmentation. Now, this is a completely total feedback failure happening. And because it's a rapid onset, how this ectopic ACT syndrome will develop, that typically there are no uh, typical Cushing syndrome sign. So the patient won't develop, for example, central obesity, buffalo hair, moon face, and so on, and so on. Mostly the clinical symptoms coming from the metabolic uh, alteration, so hyperglycemia or ion changes and uh, hypertension can happen in this patient. And as you see here in the graph that we do have a mass in the lung. And this is what we're showing that if we do have an ectopic ACTH for sure, a lot of cortisol, that's feedback that normal ACTH and CRH, but the ACTH is from this paraneoplastic syndrome. That can be the ectopic CRH syndrome. In this case, the pituitary ACTH is elevated and very similarly happening the same. Adrenal tumors, that's an ACTH independent form that could, these tumors usually autonomically secretes and uh, the hormone and not responding to any kind of hypothalamic stimulation. So it doesn't matter whether you use ACTH or not. Uh, when we do have adenomas, usually uh, one type of steroids is synthesized. Carcinomas, usually we do have a multiple adrocortical steroids. So they are not fully developed cells. And this is why a variety of steroid hormones elevated. Now this is the adrenal tumor when we do have, and that's a primary nodular hyperplasia that usually this kind of enzyme defect we have. Now let's see another, uh, continuing with this adrenal gland. The, this patient is a 41 year old Caucasian female who was admitted to the hospital for evaluation of high blood cortisol level. Her complaints were fatigue, weakness, lethargy, decreased concentration and decreased memory. Uh, over the last 18 months. She also gained uh, 40 pounds, about 20 kilograms over the last two months with central distribution of weight gain and neck obesity. Physical examination was remarkable for the Cushingoid appearance with a body weight of 110 kilograms, pulmonary team and hirsutism. Lab dexamethasone suppression tests were considered with a Cushing disease. Uh, because we do have a higher than 50% inhibition. MRI examination of pituitary didn't show any abnormality. However, the CT scan of the chest with a contrast revealed 
a left upper lobe of the lung, uh, measuring, let's see, the size of one and a half, one and a half centimeters. So this is an ectopic ACT syndrome, but this, let's see, tumor didn't know the rule and we still could achieve some kind of inhibition. So you don't need to be surprised if, uh, if you have an inhibition and you don't see any tumor, you have to keep searching the tumor, for example, in other areas. Okay, let's go to the mineral corticoids. The mineral corticoid, as I mentioned, that's regulated mainly by the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. So angiotensin II that regulates the cortical mineral corticoids effect. However, as we mentioned so far, the ACTH itself or the decrease of the serum sodium concentration or the elevated potassium concentration also affecting the aldosterone release. The aldosterone affecting on the distal tubule, the sodium in bicarbonate reabsorption and the potassium excretion happening. This is why the both blood volume increases, the preload increases as uh, with the water retention plus the angiotensin II directly will cause the peripheral resistance increases. So the blood pressure will increase. Now, what's going to regulate the renin release? First of all, the blood volume, the blood pressure, and the filtrated amount of sodium and potassium in the distal tubule, and the beta adrenergic stimulation as well. Now, uh, when we do have more, because you already discussed when we had less as a part of the adrocortical failure, when we have more, and especially that's a primary, when we do have a problem with the adrenal cortex itself, that's called the cone syndrome. That can be due to the aldosterone producing adenomas or carcinomas or hyperplasia and a certain enzymes. If you could recall what we discussed previously, 17 alpha hydroxylase, so there's no glucocorticoid synthesis occurs, everything going downward to the mineral corticoid to the aldosterone. In 11 beta hydroxylase deficiency, we don't have glucocorticoid nor uh, uh, aldosterone, but we do have the deoxycorticosterone as a previous step for the 11 beta hydroxylase enzyme, and the deoxycorticosterone has a very good mineral corticoid action. This is why we do have a mineral corticoid access. This is what is, you can see it. This is the enzyme level and that 11 deoxycorticosterone has mineral corticoid action, but because there is no cortisol, feedback mechanism is missing, a lot of ACTH and everything going down, down, down in this step. 17 hydroxylase, it's going to prevent the formation of the cortisol plus the androgens as well. In 11 beta hydroxyase, we do have androgens a lot, not only the mineral corticoids. Now the secondary mineral corticoid excess, relatively when we do have an increased renin level. So in this case, the secondary position is not the pituitary, but the renin. Now there are two possibilities. These mineral corticoid excess can associate it with hypertension or no hypertension. The difference between these two, I would say that the plasma volume is decreased when we don't have hypertension and to restore the normal blood volume or blood pressure, we have increased mineral corticoid level. In a case when we do have a normal blood volume, and something else increases the renin, that will cause hypertension. Such as, for example, the renal vascular diseases, as you do see, atherosclerosis or renal infarction that reduces the perfusion in the kidney or renin secreting tumor or as a part of the accelerated hypertension, oestrogen therapy can cause. Without hypertension, if somebody losing, for example, sodium, there's a sodium wasting syndrome, or this very common one, the edematosus stage, for example, cirrhosis, when we do have ascites, and this is why the redistribution, we have less blood volume, or nephrotic syndrome, not nephritic, nephrotic syndrome, when we do have uh, increased protein excretion, we do have decreased oncotic pressure, and this is why we do have edema. Or congestive heart failure again, that we do have edema. Or another 
problem when we do have the barter syndrome that associated with hypokalemia, hyperinemia, and hyperaldosteronism. So these are the typical causes of the secondary mineral corticoid excess. Now, this only to summarize it, how the picture looks like. If we do have an increased aldosterone, that will cause metabolic alkalosis, not only hypertension, the metabolic alkalosis, and the metabolic alkalosis uh, can cause uh, the latent tetany, that's the Trousseau sign and Shostak phenomenon we will uh, deal with when we do have the hypocalcemia possible. Uh, Dr. Cocaine already mentioned this one. Now let's move on and uh, the case number four, we do have a six-year-old boy presented with a six-month history of the pubic hair grow. For the past four years, he has had a history of rapid somatic growth. The obstetric history was unremarkable. He was a full-term infant born to a 34-year-old uh, healthy mom by normal vaginal delivery after an uncomplicated gestation. His birth weight was normal and there were no neonatal problems. At nine to 18 months, his growth was at uh, 95%, per, uh, 95th percentile. That meaning the averages should be, let's see the, the normal and after over 100 or below 50 is abnormal. Now his high is the age of two and a half was average for four and a half years. So it looks like he was high bigger one and uh, weight as well. His parents was tall. His pain is appeared larger than those of his peers at three years. He developed some facial acne at uh, four years and public hair was seen at five and a half year. Physical exam, his weight was uh, uh, average for a 10 years and a nine mo uh, three months. And his weight was average for the nine years and 10 months. The blood pressure was normal. He was tall, well proportioned and musculature with a mild facial acne. The penis was larger for his age and there was fine pubic hair. Now they do have the different uh, stages of the puberty, how they, um, let's see, evaluating it. These are the standard stages two of puberty. The testes were estimated to the three milliliters volume, which small for puberty age. The neurological exam was normal. Now they measured the hormone level, the testosterone level was very high and they measured the 17 hydroxy progesterone level and that was uh, relatively low, low, low all the way. And the ACT stimulation didn't cause an increase of the cortisol level. So the cortisol level is, uh, or the metabolitis was a very good one. Now, uh, this is the syndrome, what we do have, that's called adrogenital syndrome. Adrogenital syndrome, that's a typical blockage of the steroid synthesis, that there are a zillions of steroid synthetic or enzyme blockage can happen. And in male, that can cause uh, uh, precocious puberty. Why in girl, that can cause hirsutism, amenorrhea, virilization. Now, which are these enzymes the most too common? This is what I mentioned at the beginning, the 21 hydroxyl deficiency, 11 beta hydroxyl deficiency, and the small amount we do have the three beta uh, dehydrogenase isomerase deficiency. Now, what will happen? If we do not have I uh, the cortisol, a lot of ACTH is synthesized and everything is shifted toward the normal enzyme machinery. So this is why we do have a lot of androgens. That uh, il 31 hydroxyl deficiency, that's a classical form of the um, androgenital syndrome, relatively the incidence of one out of 10,000 births, that's an autosomal recessively inherited and they do have the age link and uh, upic eschimos is common one, but 
we don't have in UPIC Eskimos, as you do see here, and, and I think it's included in the practical notes, because we do have the 21 hydroxylase, that's a proximal type, there is no cortisol, this is no feedback, so a lot of precursors is synthesized, and because none of the precursors has mineral corticoid nor glucocorticoid effect, everything is shifted to the normal enzyme system. So everything goes to the steroid, the sex steroid synthesis. This is why we do have an excess of the androgens. Uh, the 21-hydroxyase deficiency, that is missed, that cause virilization, hirsutism, uh, premature adrenergia or infertility, and no aldosterone, because there's no aldosteronic effect. This is why we do have a salt losing crisis and hyperkalemia, hypotension. That's a very common one, but usually it doesn't cause a complete blockage of the 21 hydroxylase in this patient. A newborn baby that should be considered if the baby losing, let's see, blood pressure or it can be in a shock situation, circuit or shock situation to measure the steroid level and the rule out the hydroxyase deficiency and that patient should, and the little one should be treated with mineral corticoids and glucocorticoids immediately. But sometimes that's only a minor defect in this uh, enzyme and that's uh, manifested in later age only. In another one, the 11 beta hydroxyase deficiency, that's a non classical one, relatively is rare, about one out of 200,000 birds. And uh, that increases a little bit there in you know, a Baroconi and Jewish population. And again, they do have some kind of ageally configuration, but relatively is very rare. It takes about the hydrocortical hypertasia, it's about 5% of the cases only. Now here we do have, that's a distal type block. We don't have this 11 beta hydroxyase. We do have the precursor similarly, no cortisol, so a lot of ACTH and everything is shifted toward the androgens. Blood, the deoxycorticosterone, they do have mineral cortical action. This is why this form has hypertension. Very similarly, if we do have the sign of the uh, androgen uh, excess, and we do have, let's see, the increased deoxycorticosterone. This is why we do have a hypertension and hypokalemia. Now let's look at this as the final one, the medulla, the adrenal medulla. Uh, in hypofunction, the medulla relatively, there is no big clinical symptoms. Only uh, the patient, receives glucocorticoid replacement therapy for the adrenectomy can have, but mostly manifested orthostatic hypotension. So the role of this catecholamine that is the from the medulla, mainly to maintain the blood pressure. A hyperfunction, however, that is what causing because few chromocytoma, this tumor that tries from a chromophim cells in the sympathetic nerve system. Now this uh, is very rare, relatively is very rare. It takes about 0.1% or less of the all hypertensive patient. Now, this is called the 10% tumor. Why 10%? Because in the case of the tumor, 10% bilateral, 10% extra adrenal, usually the paravertebral ganglion, the sympathetic ganglion rises, 10% herditate and 10% only the malignant one. So that was the pheochromocytoma, that the tumor that rises from the adrenal medulla. And uh, usually this tumor is, uh, rises the catecholamine in paroxysm. So not continuously, but occurs in paroxysm and is manifested with a patient with a very high hypertension. It's over 200, 250. And if somebody has aneurysm, can be ruptured very easily. Headache, sweating, palpitation, tremor, paleness, nausea, vomiting. And between the attack, usually this patient has cold hand and feet, weight loss, orthostatic hypertension and fatigue and uh, excess pain. Now, uh, 
how do we test? Because usually this is not a continuously increased catecholamine. This is why the adrenaline, noradrenaline, or dopamine level should not be measured because relatively it's inappropriate because the level is changing. Very rare when you can reach it. You can measure the metabolites such as the venelic, mandelic acid. Uh, you can measure, for example, in the urine or you can measure in the chromogranin A that usually is associated to tumor marker that associated for chromocytoma, or you can use clonidine suppression test when you use these uh, alpha blockers. And imaging techniques, ultrasound, MRI, CT, or that can be using a scintillation scan, especially it's very good one if it's not located in the medulla when it's taking place in the paravertebral ganglion. So this is how you should uh, evaluate and after it should be operated, should be removed from the gland. Okay, this is the end. And now we do have the kahu.